Um, so we've done some talks about um, crime. Tomorrow is about sex. And Friday is about food. So really good, interesting subjects. <laughs> um, today is, is uh, clearly about Shakespeare's first folio. So um, uh, I'd just like to say that we are having a Shakespeare week um, as part of celebrations for Shakespeare's the celebration of 450 years from his uh, birth, which is uh, uh, in April, so around his birthday. And it's the beginning of a whole sequence of celebrations of Shakespeare across the whole world between um, 2014 and 2016, because in 2016 we have 400th anniversary of his death. So this is the first of our celebrations relating to that. We were having a complete reading of Shakespeare's sonnets um, in this room. Probably going to take all day. We've got 100 and whatever it is, 54 people uh, reading the sonnets. It's not an attendant performance, it's to see if we can get through them, see how people, different people read them. Some people like the Lord Mayor is coming, the ex Lord Mayor, there's a number of authors. But it's mostly members of the public who are coming along, so if you can come, just drop in, it's a drop in session, come listen to Shakespeare's sonnets. We're also having other lectures, including a lecture by Emma Smith, who is basically one of the world experts on the first folio. She's going to be talking about. Um, Shakespeare when he was new, basically, when he was newly, newly printed. Not so much about the first folio, but about Shakespeare in general. So, um, at the end, uh, do come and fill out one of these uh, slips to enter our competition to win our, our book. And also, I still believe there's a cupcake on the way out. That's right, good. <laughs> a cupcake on your way out at the uh, reception. So, without more ado, let's get on with Shakespeare's first folio. Now, it's not going to be an academic talk. It's going to be a quite simple talk, just sort of talking about interesting things to do with uh, the first folio. But first of all, let's talk about what a folio uh, is, uh, in case you don't know. And I, I certainly didn't know when I first started working here. I've been here 15 years and I've learnt what these things mean. If you imagine this is a sheet of printing paper, this is about the size of a sheet of printing paper in the 16th, 17th century. Um, if you fold it in half, that's a folio, that's a folio sized piece. And it means you can print uh, four pages. One, two, three, four. As I've shown on the screen there. So that's folio size. Um, when you're printing, you would print uh, one side, print one side, you let it dry, hang it up, let it dry, and then perhaps weeks later, you might print the other side, and you would print uh, several of these into a what we call a gathering or a choir, usually at least three. So there'd be three of these which would then create uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight. That's 12 pages altogether. So that's the gathering or choir, and then you would gather those together and sew them into a book. So you'd have whole sections, this is a section. So that's a folio. That's about the size the folio would have been before it was trimmed. So when you printed it, when you finish, you would trim it down, so cut off the edges, so it'd be a bit smaller. So if you have a look at the first folio, which is on show in that case at the back, uh, at the end, <laughs> you'll see that the first folio is actually smaller than this because it's been trimmed. Some first folios are taller and narrower because they've been trimmed in a different way. They're called tall folios. But that's the si it's a size, basically, or a way of making a book. That's a folio size. Now, one, one other thing we will, we will need to know is a quarto. So you start with the same piece of paper, you print four pages that way on it, let it dry, and then print, print four pages on that side, and then you fold it like that, fold it like that, and then you trim off the, the cut to the top, either immediately um, or when you're going to bind it up. Um, so that's quarto. When you cut it down a bit more, it will be a bit smaller, a sort of like a square paper. So that's the two things I will be talking about, folios and quartos. When the talk's finished, in the first case, we've got some of our Shakespeare quartos. The next case has the folios in it. OK, so quartos and folios. So there's the quarto. Um, you can fold it in different ways, uh, but essentially that's the way you fold it. And you have to be aware that you might be um, printing your uh, page four next to your page one, etc. So they had to think about where the pages were going to appear when they folded them up and cut them, etc. Right. So, essentially, Shakespeare didn't overlook the printing of his plays in his lifetime. He, he took charge of the printing of some of his poetry, but 
Um, some of his plays were printed in his lifetime. He appears to have had nothing to do with that. Lots of them were pirated copies. People stole the text. Um, some printers got hold of the rights to the text. Essentially, um, acting troops, and he belonged to an acting company, didn't normally want to print their plays because they could still get uh, performances out of it. They didn't want some other play group having access to that text. Um, there is some debate now about whether this is actually true. And they, some people do think that maybe his company did have something to do with the printing of the plays. Um, nobody's actually sure yet. It's just a theory. But all the plays that were printed in his lifetime, with one exception, were quartos. So they were that small size, a bit smaller than that, because that's obviously before it's trimmed. So you will see in any discussion of Shakespeare, reference to the quartos. And those quartos date right from the 1590s, through to beyond his death, right through the, the um, 17th century. But the important ones uh, are the ones that were printed in his lifetime and before the first folio. Just to say the first folio was printed after his death, so we'll come back to that in a moment. Um, they were printed as a single play, and they were sold very cheaply. Um, the most popular ones are usually the histories or the tragedies. The comedies don't get printed so much in his lifetime. So for instance here, we have uh, the first, well, this is Henry VI, in fact, but not called Henry VI when it was first produced. The first part of the con contention betwixt the two famous houses of York and Lancaster, etc., etc. Richard III, which is clearly more famous than uh, Henry VI and, not, and performed more often, was one of the most popular plays at the time. It is still one of the most popular plays. It's still performed um, uh, more than most other Shakespeare plays. This is a quarto from 1612. In fact, there were five quarters, so five different editions of this play that were produced in Shakespeare's lifetime and quite a few afterwards. In the case over there, we have a facsimile of one of the, uh, the Shakespeare Richard III quarters, along with two of our other quarters. We have Othello uh, from 1639 and Henry IV from 1655, so after Shakespeare's death, but early quarters. I think that's the right way around for the date. So you have to imagine that things were produced like this, they were cheaply produced and sold for not very money. So they didn't take much care with them. Uh, they were produced for making money. And so they just wanted to get together a text. They weren't necessarily interested in getting a text that Shakespeare would agree with, or even with the company would have said that, that was the text we performed. So you get things called bad quartos, where the text differs greatly from that which appears in the first folio. And the first folio is the collected works of Shakespeare. So these are all individual works. So you might come across references to bad quartos. There's some debate about whether a bad quarto just represents a, um, a performing version of the play rather than a final version of the play. So some of the plays that go through several editions, it could be that the actual performance has changed. They've changed the text. They're adapting the text and they're ending up with a final version. Nobody actually knows the answer to these questions, so there's some debate about what these texts will represent. So that's the quartos. Now we get on to the folios. So the folio is used usually, before Shakespeare's first folio, with one exception, was used for very grand books, for serious publications, often used for <coughs> histories, and uh, very rarely used for anything else. In the case at the back, you will see there's the complete works of King James I. That was published in that scale. It's basically showing off. So King James I wanted his book published in folio because it was expensive. You could get in a lot of text. You could get in a lot of decoration in it. His book was published in 1616. And in that same year, we get the very first folio-sized publication devoted to plays. And it's the works of Ben Johnson, so a contemporary of Shakespeare, um, uh, uh, competed really with Shakespeare, and a friend of Shakespeare. The difference between the works of Ben Johnson and the Shakespeare's first folio, which comes later, is that Ben Johnson's uh, first folio includes his poetry. The first folio of Shakespeare doesn't include his poetry, it only includes the plays. So this is the first book uh, of this status devoted to drama and, and poetry, essentially. So it's, it's unique, really, in the history of printing. And it shows you the status that drama was acquiring in Shakespeare's lifetime, in Ben Johnson's lifetime. 
It was becoming important enough, not just to be produced in those autos, but for them all to be gathered together, get the text together, and put it into a complete works. So 1616, the year of Shakespeare's death, was the year that uh, this, court, this folio, the Ben Johnson's plays, was published. This is just the front page of that volume devoted to uh, King James. As I say, it's in the case at, at the back. So you can see, folio is high status, usually. Right. Shakespeare dies in 1616. And in 1619, the publisher, uh, Thomas Pavia, printed editions of Henry V, two Henry VI plays, with a joint title, King Lear, Merchant Venice, Merry Wives of Windsor, Midsummer Night's Dream, Pericles, and two plays that have been attributed to Shakespeare at the time. Uh, that's the first part of Sir Old Castle and the Yorkshire Tragedy, which we'll come back to a bit later. Um, and what he did when he published these um, as portos is he had continuous page numbering through several portos. So it looked like he was intending to gather them together with that continuous uh, page numbering. So it looks like Thomas Bailey was attempting to create a complete works of Shakespeare, almost issued in parts. But, with the assistance of their patron, the Earl of Pembroke, the leading players of the King's Men, and that's, that's um, Shakespeare's um, acting group, so the leading players were Richard Burbage, John Hemmings, and Henry Condor, uh, obtained an order preventing Pavia uh, or anyone else from going any further with such an enterprise. That's because, uh, as members of that troop, essentially they owned the rights to a lot of those Shakespeare plays. And obviously they were intending to publish them themselves. Burbage died, uh, in 1619. So Hemmings and Condon carried forward with the project. Materials were gathered together and printed, printing started in 1621. It included 36 pages, as I said, not the poetry. Um, so it's important to, to realize that they didn't necessarily have the text to hand because the texts were in manuscript mostly at this time. They probably would have collected some of the quarto versions together, collected uh, manuscript texts, working texts from the theater. They would have asked people if they could remember their lines, and try and get a, uh, a version of the play that they all agreed was the version that perhaps Shakespeare intended or the, the players it, uh, performed on stage. So important is the first folio in the history of English literature that there is a monument to the first folio, and it's just out that window. So after we finish, if you just look out the window, you will see this monument in the churchyard of St Mary, called um, the It's a monument to the first folio, not to Shakespeare. And it's here because Hemmings and Condal, the two, his friends who uh, compiled it, lived in this parish. So they lived in the parish of St Mary Aldermanbury. In fact, Shakespeare lived about 100 yards in that direction, in Silver Street for a short period. Um, and he had property in Blackfriars uh, as well as in Suffolk. So a monument uh, just outside the window to the first folio. The printer and publisher, and it, there's, there's a no, no necessarily a differentiation between printer and publisher at this period, was a man called William Jaggard and his son Isaac, along with Edward Blunt. Uh, and they were printing the collection. The printing of the collection was an enormous task. So it's going to be 900 pages long, a book that's very long for a book in the 17th century. Uh, during this era, there's no copyright law. So what you'd normally do is you, you'd register your book at the station's register. And their version was registered on the 8th of November, 1623. So we know they started compiling the printing in 1621 and didn't actually finish until 1623. Approximately 750 copies of the first value were printed. Nobody's certain how many there are. Some people say 500, some people say 1,200. So I've gone with what Emma Smith says, one of the experts. She says 750, so that's what I'm going to say. Uh, there were 15 shillings unbound, and that's um, important to mention that because lots of people bought their books unbound and then took them to their binder and bound in a binding that matched their other books at home. Um, lots of people would have also bought them bound, and it was a pound to have one bound. Essentially, it's no more, it's, it was no more expensive to buy a first folio than it was to buy all the plays, it had you been able to buy all the plays in Porto. It would have cost about the same. Uh, but this is in the larger scale, it's better printed, uh, has decorations on it, it has dedications, etc. Approximately 238 known copies, copies exist today. There are some copies that they knew now existed in the 19th century that nobody can trace at the moment. So some might turn up, but that's essentially how many there are. About 90 of them were in the Folger in Washington. Um, uh, 
quite a few are in Japan, um, and the rest are scattered, and very few are in private hands today. If Hemings and Condor had not collected together Shakespeare's plays, we would have lost all of these plays. Half of his plays would have disappeared. And these are not just minor plays, these are things like the Tempest um, Company there, as, as you like it, Tenure Troop, Twelfth Night, uh, Julius Caesar, Macbeth. So we'd have lost all of those plays because they had not been printed before 1623. And they don't survive in manuscript form. In fact, no play survives completely in manuscript form uh, from Shakespeare, apart from part of a play that may be in his hand, uh, called Sir Thomas More, which is in the British Library. Um, apart from that, none of his plays exist in his hand or in anybody else's hand from the period of Shakespeare. So we would have lost 18 plays had they not produced these uh, works at that time. When they gathered together all the plays, they decided to group them. And they grouped them, as we recognize them today, as comedies, histories, and tragedies. Um, they decided on that. That's not something that when they're publishing auto, it said this belongs to a group of histories or tragedies. Sometimes it would say the tragedy of or the history of. and doesn't normally say the comedy. So they decided to group them like this, and this is how we've grouped them ever since. They also included, amongst uh, other things like dedications and poetry and a sort of introduction, a list of the actors who performed in most of these plays. And as you can see, Shakespeare's at the top. These are also people who, who were, um, some of them were shareholders in the company. So Shakespeare's on uh, Burbage, uh, who had died by that time, but Hemmings uh, is on there. Um, as one of the uh, people who compiled the, the book. Now just to say something about how the book was printed, and this is slightly complicated, and I try to be to make it as clearly as I can. If you're going to print, so let's let's we're going to, he's going to print the part of the first folio dedicated to a fellow. The essential problem that a 17th century printer has is he hasn't got enough type to print the whole book at once. So you can't set up all 900 pages and then print them. So he has to decide how many pages he can print at once. And it could be that you can actually only print uh, at one time two pages, possibly a gathering of six, eight, twelve pages. Because he's only got, <coughs> most printers only have one or two um, presses. You can see this is a Flemish image of a contemporary. Uh, they've only got um, two presses. So you set up your type to print, say, eight pages. You check them to make sure they were right, and often they weren't right. Um, you might correct them if you spot an error. You print off how many copies you think you need of those eight or twelve pages. So they say they wanted 750 copies. They print off 750 copies. And then they would pull the type apart and set it up for the next batch of pages. So the difficult thing is, because they're trying to calculate the amount of space they need to get the inner pages, often if you look through the first folio, you used to realize that when they got to the inner pages, they were running out of space, so they used to jam it up. They, they squashed it up or made the columns broader, they put them two columns. Sometimes they found they had too much space and then spread it out to fill the space. But all what they're doing all the time is um, they're calculating how much. It's a great skill to calculate it. Um, it's what um, printers did all the time. Here you can see they're working from manuscript here, and they're setting up, this is the time they're setting up um, into a sort of stick, which they then went onto the, the form to be printed. So you print 750 pages, you let them dry, you might print the, other, the back of them, and you keep your stock, you keep them piling up, and you'll be correcting. They corrected as they printed them. So, uh, earlier pages might have uh, errors in them that are not in later pages when they realise they've, they've uh, made a, a mistake. But what it meant was, when they finished 750 copies, they couldn't do a reprint because they destroyed all the, all the type, creating the next batch of type. So you need to keep that in mind when we sort of look at what the first page looks like inside. Um, and interestingly, rather than saying on the, on the, on the front of the book, uh, on the title page, who the publisher was, it's right at the end. And this is where it says, uh, printed at the charge, charges of uh, William Jaggard, Edward Blunt. Uh, uh, these two people are lesser uh, partners in, in printing of it, um, 1623. 
Right. I'm going to talk something about the physicality of the book, and this is referring to our copy. Now, our copy is uh, one of those surviving copies. It's been looked at by two of the world experts on the first folio. Uh, they decided it's amongst the top five copies in the world. That's because it is absolutely complete. And when I show you some of the other copies, you realize why that's so important. Um, it's missing nothing, so far as we can tell. I'll come to one bit that might be in facsimile. Um, and we know it's provenance. We know it was owned by a prime minister in the 18th century, uh, Lord Shelburne. It came to the London Institution in the 19th century, and then was acquired by us, given to us, Guildhall Library, in the 20th century. Um, when it was last seen by Emma Smith from uh, Oxford University, she said it was the best copy she'd ever seen. So it's, compared to other copies, it's pristine. Um, as I say, it's on display just for today, and each Wednesday for the next two months it's on display in this exhibition. So this is our copy in a 20th century binding. It was rebound by Zainsdorf, by, um, commissioned by us in the 1920s. Uh, in the 20th century binding, it made to look like a 17th century binding. This is a 17th century binding on the first folio. This is the body of the library's uh, copy of the first folio. So you can see there's an attempt to make it look very similar, very plain, uh, not highly decorated. So this is, this is uh, the Guildhall Library's first folio. Um, just to say some of the things that are slightly uh, wrong with it. Um, it has some tiny little nicks down here, you can just see them, which we've had repaired. That's one of the reasons we don't let people handle it very much. It's, it's quite a delicate book. Keep turning these pages and I'll show you what happens later on when I show you what I like this copy. Um, some discolor discoloration, but not very much. Um, also, I should point out that um, the famous image of Shakespeare that appears in the frontispiece is in two versions. Uh, one version doesn't have this shadowing here. You see these shadow lines. This is the first version, this is the second version. And also the highlights are stronger in this one compared to that one. Um, the artist who created it probably saw it off the printing press, realised it wasn't up to the standard he wanted, and so he increased some of the, some of the detailing. Uh, this is our copy. Um, first folios with that version are probably only three or four in the world have survived, so he obviously changed it very quickly in the process. Uh, not a great work of art, but uh, the most famous image of Shakespeare that we have. Um, I said there was, might be something wrong. Uh, somebody who surveyed our first folio in the 1960s said that part of this bit here was in facsimile, i.e. somebody probably inked it in rather than it being printed. We've shown this to conservators. Nobody can, can see where, it's, where this has happened, so we're not sure about that. The only other major defect is, is this bit here. You can see that's a repair just along there. But apart from that, apart from being a bit grubby, it's perfect. Um, just to say something very quickly about uh, when they were compiling um, Shakespeare's plays, the uh, publishers couldn't get hold of Trollis and Creston. Um, they thought that it was owned by somebody else and they wouldn't be able to include it. But then somebody remembered that they inherited the rights to a different, another printer who actually had Joyce and Cressida earlier in the, the century. And they proved to the stations register that actually they did own Joyce and Cressida. So they, they introduced it into the printing late on. So if you look at the list of plays at the beginning, it doesn't include, include Joyce and Cressida, but the play is included because they had to jam it in later on. In doing so, as I explained how they had to make things fit by squashing them up or threading them apart, they would do things like this, put these um, decorations in to fill in blank spaces. They would also endeavour not to waste any paper. Um, so normally, um, the play would start on that side if there was a blank sheet. Because um, they had to rearrange all the sheets, they ended up with a blank sheet. They couldn't get it to, to go there. Um, they also filled out space by including the names of the actors. It's not the names of the actors, it's the names of the parts, in fact, but they're calling the actors. So that fills out a bit of space um, in, in our first folio. Our first folio also has some inscriptions. Um, you can see this looks like somebody's name here. It might be Robert, it might be Richard. Something's happened here. But clearly, when it was bound at some point, um, this is 17th century handwriting, so after the 17th century, it was trimmed. You know, I said they were often trimmed. 
When it was bound, it was trimmed. I'm hoping that when we, when Kildra might be bound in, in the 1920s, we didn't do this. Because mm. these are details of provenance. These are important to know who owned this book, who might have written on it, etc. I'm hoping that somebody in the 18th century did this to the book, and it wasn't us. Um, again, where they couldn't get the plays to start on, uh, on the play to watch them start on, they might add a prologue. And in fact, they've shifted, taken the prologue out of the play and put it here to fill up some space. So you can see all through the printing, they're changing and um, uh, adapting. And that means that if you, any world expert who looks at a first folio can work out where, when between 1621 and 1623 that particular copy probably came off the press, which parts came off the press. So they can date that particular one by the changes, by the errors, by the things like this. This is why you can see they're squashing up the text. And sometimes they do corrections in pen. It's the printer doing the corrections rather than because you can't set up the printer again. He corrects it with a pen. The other thing that happens is that um, a printer may be printing Shakespeare's uh, complete works, and then for some reason it has to stop, maybe because they find they're trying to get hold of Troilus and Cressida. So instead of just sitting there doing nothing, they start to print another book, so the histories of somebody. Um, and in doing so, they use the same type that they're using for Shakespeare, and also these, these rules, these are metal lines that they insert to guide up the text. So people who've studied the things printed by Jaggard can recognise these here and any little bits of damage to the text where they occur in somebody else's book. So they can work out that say January to June they were printing Shakespeare and then from July to September they were printing something else. They can work out the order that things were printed by the amount of damage that happens to various um, parts of the text. So this here this line here would have been on a very thin piece of metal inserted into the form. At some point it got bent, and that's why it has that little thing in there. You can trace that bent piece of metal. Early on in Shakespeare it's not bent. As you go through the printing, it gets bent, and then you see it turning up in the other books where they haven't changed it back to a straight piece, and then back into Shakespeare. So with very, very careful and precise study, you can trace the history of that bent bit of metal and date the particular editions. The same with those decorations. So you see here, this line on the decoration is virtually complete across the top, a little bit of nicking at the top there. But later on in the printing, a, it was obviously damaged, dropped, somebody hit it, whatever, which caused that there. So you can also use that to work out at what stage a particular play was printed, because they didn't print the book from beginning to end. They might print Coriolanus, which was on page 466, and then print something else, move back to the woods. They go and print a completely different book. So you can see, early on in printing, there's no damage. Later in printing, a bit of damage occurs. So this is for a complete Shakespeare geeks, this sort of thing, you know, sort of tracing uh, the histories of uh, various things like this. Now to say, when you look at our copy, you'll see what fine condition it is in. This is the last copy that was sold at auction. This is Dr. Williams' library copy. Um, this is from the auction catalogue, and very oddly, the auctioneers had it photographed with casting light. I don't know why they did that, because it shows up every imperfection on the title page. You can see, compared to the little nicks on the edge of our copy, you can see what condition this is in, including a terrible stamp from the 19th century probably on the front. Uh, creases here, uh, and there's some parts. This here is a facsimile, whereas on ours it's the it's complete. This is from the Bodleian Library's first folio. The Bodleian Library famously acquired the first folio in 1623. They got it the year it was published. They had it bound. We know who it was bound by. Then when the second folio came out, the second edition came out about, about uh, 10 years later, they disposed of their first folio because the new edition had come out, which is what a pensible library would do at the time. Um, and they didn't know where it was for hundreds of years. And then somebody walked into the library in 1905 and wanted some advice on some binding of a first folio. You know, the librarian recognised it um, from various marks on it as Bodleian's original copy of the first folio. In between, they had acquired another one in the few hundred years in between the two. But what they did was they didn't do anything to it. They didn't change the binding. It had its 1624 binding on it, I showed you earlier on. 
and it had this sort of damage. So it's only when you, when you start to look at other properties you realise, or I realise, how important that property is. And you can see lots of handling from students in the first 20 or 5, 25 years. And it's like, it's probably done this, but they've turned the page a lot. That's the condition that it was in. It has gone through conservation. This is from the blog about this conservation. But you can see not just a few nicks on the first page, but crum basically crumbling going on here. Um, and they got sponsorship uh, to, um, to deal with it. And then this is the, uh, the second folio. So they print 750 copies of the first folio, and they essentially try and sell them all. That's what they want to do. They want to make money. And it takes them um, uh, nine years to sell all the copies. So they weren't sold very quickly. It was an expensive thing to buy at the time. Um, and then they produce, uh, a group of people who have some interest in the first folio produce the second folio, which is essentially a reprint of the first folio, but contains over a thousand different errors in it, because they had to set up, set up the text again, because they didn't have the text waiting. They had set up again and made a thousand different errors. They're minor, uh, but they were using the first folio as the model. So 1632 is the, uh, the second folio. Gilder and Lovey doesn't have a second folio. We have a first, a third, and a fourth, and they're all on display. And we don't have a second. If you've got one you don't want, you'd be glad to take it off your hands. Um, this is the third folio, uh, which was published in 1664. And it's not a reprint of the others, because it includes some extra plays. The one play that was missing from the first folio was Pericles. Um, that's the 37th play, which is agreed to this by um, William Shakespeare. So that was added to the third folio. But they also added these other plays. If you remember, I pointed out two of these earlier on. So these were thought at the time to be by Shakespeare. It's clearly his friends who had compiled the first folio didn't think they were by Shakespeare, so they didn't include them. Uh, there's lots of debate about it, but most people agree that these are not by Shakespeare. If they are, they're only partly by Shakespeare. So that's the third folio, published in 1664. And that is the rarest. The third folio is the rarest. It's not the most valuable. It's the rarest because the print run probably was mostly destroyed in the Great Fire of London two years afterwards, because it takes some years to sell uh, the print run. So that's probably why it's the rarest edition, as I say, not the um, uh, most valuable. We've got the third folio on display. And then this is the fourth folio, which is 1685, uh, and it's essentially a reprint of the third folio. It includes those um, plays, including Pericles, but those ones that are now no longer regarded as uh, being by Shakespeare. Okay, so that is the, basically the story of the first folio and of our first folio. Um, certainly do have a look at the material on display. The first folio itself, as I say, is only on display on Wednesdays, simply because um, for security reasons. Um, it is very valuable. Um, and we've got autos on display. Uh, we've got a case over there with 18th century editions of Shakespeare. In the 18th century, they seem to have no regard for Shakespeare's uh, originality. They didn't mind changing it, adapting it, giving comic endings, happy endings to King Lear, for instance. <laughs> um, and then over in the last case, there's some 19th century printing of Shakespeare including a sort of return to an academic view of Shakespeare, where they attempted to bring together all the different versions. So if you have a look over there, there's a version of King Lear, where the actual text is about that long, and the notes are about that long, where they show you the variations through each of the quartos and each of the folios, um, to show you the different variations of the text, um, because nobody's absolutely sure which version is the one that Shakespeare might have agreed with. Uh, but it's a, a view of uh, the different texts, so that's the 19th century. And that is the end of the talk. Thank you very much. Thank you.